All right. Whenever, whenever you, you tell me, Karina, we're, we're good now? Yeah. Yes. We're good now. You, we can start. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon here in Chile and uh, whatever times is around the world where you are. My name is Felipe Ochoa and I am a faculty of geotechnical engineering here at University of Chile. And today we are having a very nice seminar. The name of the seminar is Lessons from the Lives of Two Dams. And the speaker we have today is a geo legend of geotechnical engineering because we are today here with Professor James K. Mitchell, the author of the book, Fundamentals of Soil Behavior. Dear Professor Mitchell, hello, how are you? Very Hi. nice to, to meet you, to see you, and having you here at the University of Chile, sharing with, with, with us your knowledge. Thank you very much for being here. How are you today? Oh, I'm very fine, thank you, Felipe. It's nice to um, be with you. In what city are you based these days, Professor Mitchell? Well, I'm now I'm I'm now living in a a small town called South Hadley in the state of Massachusetts. It's about uh, oh two hours by car from to the west of Boston, Massachusetts. I see. Are you from there originally? Where Where are you no, from? We here. Originally? We're here uh, in a retirement uh, village to be closer to members of our family. Ah, I see. But and you are and from what part of the U.S. are you from originally? Originally, well, that <laughs> I I was uh, I was in Western New York State for many years. I see. And uh, out near Buffalo, New York, and then. Uh, then I was at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute uh, in, in Eastern New York State as an undergraduate. And then I was at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, as a graduate student. As a graduate student. How many, how you did your master's and PhD in, in MIT? At MIT, yes. I see. And, and, in, and your advisor was what professor in MIT? Uh, T.W. Lamb. Professor Lamb, from, yep. the, from, the, from the book of uh, Lamb and Whitman, right? Lamb and Whitman, or, yes, yeah. I see, I see. And, and, after, and after your PhD, where, where, did you, where did you go? Did you go immediately to Berkeley or somewhere else? No, I went, uh, I went immediately to the Corps of Engineers Laboratory at Vicksburg, oh. Mississippi, and uh, Waterways Experiment Station, it was called. And mm -hmm. after a short period there, I went in the Army, uh, and I was in Germany uh, for uh, more than a year. And then I went from there to Berkeley. Oh, I see. And how many years passed between, how, how long was that period that you went to Germany? Oh, that was just a year and a half. Year and a half. And it, it was two and a half years in the army, and then I went to Berkeley uh, for uh, thirty-six years. Thirty-six years. Long yeah. story, huh? A long story in Berkeley. Yeah, and then I went to Virginia Tech, and I was there for twenty-six years. Twenty-six I, years. Wow. <laughs> so now, now where I am, I've been about two years. I see. I see. And um, you were you were at Berkeley, and what at the time at Berkeley? During the time at Berkeley, uh, you work uh, you were colleagues and friends with uh, what professors at the time? Professor Seed. Well, Professor Harry Bolton Seed is the one that brought me to Berkeley, oh. and that was that was in nineteen fifty eight. 1958. 1958. Yeah. And I left there. I retired there in 1994. 1994. And went to Virginia Tech uh, on the other side of the country uh, in uh, 1994 and moved from there to where I am now in 2020. 
I see. So you were with Dr. Duncan in, in both Berkeley and, and yes. Virginia Tech. Yeah. I see. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. How, how many students did you graduate, Professor, PhD students? PhD students, me? At the mm -hmm. two, univer two universities, I think it's 76. Wow. <laughs> wow, huge production, eh? Yeah. Wow, amazing. Amazing. And, and um, uh, what was your, during all these years, what, what was your favorite project, for instance? Or what are your current projects these days? Oh, well, right now, now I'm, I'm mostly retired now, so I can't, I can't speak of a project now, but uh, I was very much involved in, in the 1960s and early 70s in uh, studying the soil on the moon. And wow. so I was involved in the Apollo program for several years. And that was most interesting and exciting, and pioneering. Um, did you did you did you have to share at the time uh, with with some of the astronauts, for instance, with yes. uh, with some of the astronauts? Yes, we 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 had a small group that were we did what was called the the soil mechanics experiment. Uh, we began working with the geologists. Then we had our own experiments and we worked uh, on various aspects of all the, lun the lunar landings. I see. Well, I, now, now people are studying the moon again, right? There, there are many studies, geotechnical studies these days also. Well, uh, yeah, there's some uh, and, and, and also on Mars. I see, yeah. I see. And, and, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your book, your fundamentals of soil behavior? Maybe because now it's it's on the third edition. It, with the third edition was published in 2005. With Professor Soga. With Professor Soga. And he and I and uh, Professor uh, Catherine Sullivan from Imperial College are working on the fourth edition. Very nice. And hopefully, very, very nice. hopefully we'll get it done within the next uh, year or so. For sure, it will be it will be done soon. For sure. I mean, um, we we are looking forward to that book. Of well, course, we're looking forward to getting it finished. <laughs> so much new material, new things. It's uh, quite a challenge. The Definitely. field is expanding rapidly. Oof. Too too quick, very yeah. very 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 rapidly indeed. And uh, just one more quick question: uh, What do you, do you have any any hobbies or any activities that you like to do outside of the all the geotech you you do? Well, yes, uh, but like I say, I'm pretty much retired, but. Now, but before that, I uh, used to uh, uh, I like to play golf, but I was very poor at it. And my major activity, other than my family, which was always very important, uh, was playing uh, uh, playing the saxophone. Oh, wow! Yeah, and I always, for the last I don't know, 25, 30 years. I was playing in two bands, a concert, oh, really? band, a concert band, and then a uh, big band, a swing band. In, in California, when well, you were in, in Berkeley? In Berkeley and in Virginia, yeah. Nice, very nice. Lots, did, lots, of fun. lots of fun. Did you ever have a geotech band? Uh, a geotech band? Yeah, like a geotech band with maybe another faculty, because well, I know we, I, I once saw Dr. Goodman playing really, really well piano. Oh, yes, he was outstanding. He was yes. a colleague of mine at Berkeley. He was, he was outstanding uh, uh, playing the piano and uh, singing in operas. He was very good at that. 
he he had an opera co- he had an opera company uh, company in Berkeley. Wow, I didn't yeah. know that. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Well, that, that's that's fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing all those details, yeah. Professor Mitchell. Right. Um, I I will I will let you to to have the presentation. Uh, maybe we can do some more questions by the end of the of the of the talk. Okay. Uh, again, thank you very yeah. much for being here with us and sharing your knowledge with us. I will turn off my microphone and camera so you can start with the presentation. Thank you okay. very much again, Professor. Thank you. All right, uh, everybody. What I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon, I've called Lessons from the Lives of Two Dams. And these are two projects that I worked on uh, while I was in California, the later years of when I was in California. And a little bit of background first. Of course, there are a lot of dams were constructed, at least in this country, in the first six decades of the 20th century. And uh, the Great Alaska Earthquake, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and the Japan Earthquake in 1964, uh, uh, they really focused the attention of everybody on soil liquefaction and ground deformation and earthquakes. And uh, what really started things going uh, very, very strongly in California was the near failure of the lower San Fernando Dam and in the magnitude 6.6 earthquake in 1971. And so everybody started looking at other dams that were susceptible to possible uh, problems in earthquakes. And now we find that the maximal, maximum credible earthquakes and the maximum probable FUD uh, and the populations, they've all increased at many sites uh, ever since they built all those dams. And of course, the existing dams, just because of their age, uh, uh, have had certain problems. And so risk analyses have shown unacceptably high consequences unless something was done uh, in many of the case of many of these dams. And what I'm going to do in this presentation is describe what's been done at two of these dams. And these dams briefly were the San Pablo Dam, which is near Oakland, California. It's a hydraulic fill structure founded on alluvial deposits, and it was completed in 1921. The other uh, structure I'll talk about is the Mormon Island Auxiliary Dam, or some, some of us just call it Mayad. It's near Sacramento in California. It's a compacted fill embankment that's founded on hydraulically deposited dredger tailings from the gold mining days in the, in the, uh, uh, oh, the late 1800s. And that dam was completed in 1956. And each of these was considered to be unsafe, uh, under seismic loading. And so several modifications were made to each dam and they extended over rather long periods from 1967 to 2010 at San Pablo Dam and from the late eight, 1980s uh, to 2017 at Mormon Island Dam. I'm gonna tell you about these modifications and I'm gonna hopefully draw some conclusions, some lessons learned, about geotechnical earthquake engineering for dams, seismic remediation strategies, the importance of proper site material characterization, and a bit about the advantages and limitations of some of the ground improvement methods that have been used. So let's begin with San Pablo Dam. Not a terribly large structure, uh, but this is wh what it is. It's a water retention dam for the uh, East Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area in California. And that's about the way it looks like under uh, in normal operating conditions. So it's about uh, 53 meters high. It's uh, 360 meters long. It's a hydraulic fill dam and it was completed in 1921. It's founded on alluvial 
deposits that contain some zones susceptible to liquefaction. And it was of a hydraulic fill dam consisting of weathered sandstone and shale that were taken, just taken from the hills near Oakland, California. And this dam is located within a few kilometers of major active faults. And you can see some of them on this diagram, on this map. And here is San Francisco. Here is Oakland. Here is the dam site and its reservoir. It doesn't show the reservoir on this map. Uh, these are the major faults that are running through the area. There's the San Andreas Fault and the Hayward Fault. And there's a, a, a couple other faults over here. And the seismologists and geologists worked out some years ago that there would be about a 62% chance of that dam failing under a magnitude 6.7 earthquake or greater in during the period of some 30 years. And uh, so those are the probabilities. And what's interesting here is uh, uh, it's right next to the Hayward Fault, the San Pablo Dam. And I lived at that time, when I was uh, the last 30 years I was in California, I lived right about uh, right about here in this area right here. And uh, so I'm not very far from the dam. Uh, I guess fortunately, if it failed, all the water would go would go north and not south. So I wasn't really at risk, but uh, it still was not anything I would look forward to. Uh, so the dam itself, had its origins way back in the early 1900s. And what you're looking at here are a few photographs that were taken during its construction. Uh, I may sound and look like I was there, uh, but actually I'm a little bit younger than 1917. It's a birthday. So I did not see this, but these came from the files. And what you're looking at here is a core trench that was going to underlie the dam and serve as a cutoff between the bottom of the base of the dam and uh, the underlying rock. And all the material above this point is going to be brought in here hydraulically and dumped. And the hydraulic fill came from the East Bay Hills near Oakland, also very close to where I live. And they got the material from the embankments or from the, the natural hills just by water jetting and bringing it down uh, into sluices and into pipes and so on and carrying it down to the site of the dam and dumping it hydraulically. So it's, it came from up in here and it was being brought over into here. And uh, this is a photo taken in 1919 and uh, the hydraulic can fill construction was getting underway. And here you see uh, that the materials coming in from the hills in slurry form and being deposited hydraulically in here. That core trench ex excavation is right down under here. And this is the base of the dam. And what the way this works is that the material is being brought in in suspension. It's being dumped in here and the coarser material moves from where it's being dumped in, uh, in the central point, and it flows this way and this way and begins to sediment out. And so what you get is, is a coarser sandy uh, material here. Whoops, I'm sorry, I, I need to get these to go back. And, uh, oh, I need to back up this. Um, here we go. Here we go. There we are back where I belong. And the characteristic of this hydraulic place thing is that you have fine settling out after the other material settles, settles up 
and that forms the core of the dam. And uh, uh, it coarsens a bit, and they uh, from from the center line upstream and downstream, and uh, that material settles in rather loose form, um, and if they form the shells, the the sandy parts of, of the hydraulic fill form the shells, and that was the way many dams were constructed uh, during that period. And this was some hydraulically placed rock in the San Pablo Dam. Um, and some of these pieces of rock are pretty large, up to a cubic foot in size. But when all was finished with that dam, it looked like this. And when it was full, the water was up here. And unfortunately, it was not seismically very safe. So in the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, they assumed that it was a liquefiable embankment because it was a hydraulic fill. And these hydraulic fill structures can be very, very susceptible to liquefaction. And uh, uh, so they've been a problem and it's, 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 it's difficult because of the way they're constructed and it takes a lot of uh, uh, effort uh, to assure stability in an earthquake thereafter. But anyhow, a few tests on the embankment materials showed that it was had a high liquefaction potential, and so they decided to mediate the, re, the to to mitigate the failure. And the first thing that was done was that a small downstream butler was constructed in 1967. Then they constructed a larger upstream buttress to bedrock in 1979. And so at that point in time, here's what you had. Here's the original hydraulically placed material. The fines are here. There's that core trench. This is the coarser shell. And this is more coarse shell. This is the small downstream abutment, uh, berm, uh, berm, stabilizing berm. And this is the larger upstream buttress that was placed uh, after the, the first one. This was placed in 1970, whatever, 1979. Uh, now, keeping in mind that this whole reservoir and the dam were within a populated area, uh, and it was uh, not only a water storage facility, it was a recreational facility. If you're going to build a buttress like this, what do you have to do? You got to dewater the reservoir to get this thing all the way down to here. That's not very popular with the public. They don't like to see the reservoirs drain. They don't like to see the reserve uh, water supply uh, taken away for a protracted period or any of those things. So from a public relations standpoint, it is not very popular to have to go in and drain a reservoir to get your buttress down to here. But nonetheless, they did that. And, and uh, uh, that gives you a pretty good idea of what San Pablo Dam looked like uh, in 19, after 1979. In 2004, they did some more evaluation of this dam by assuming a liquefiable embankment. And if it was indeed liquefiable, as they thought it would be, you might get slumping of 35 feet and overtopping in a magnitude seven and a quarter earthquake on the Hayward Fault. So this uh, was of concern. The first thing that was done, the reservoir level was lowered by 20 feet and the public wasn't very happy with that either. And if they were gonna completely rebuild the dam, you'd have to drain the reservoir. So they decided they would make it seismically safe if they could using cement deep soil mixing to depths up to 120 feet 
through the alluvial foundation soils to rock, along with a large downstream buttress fill. At the same time, they began lots of uh, new field investigations of this embankment and its foundation to see if they really had that figured out right in the first place. And in fact, they didn't have it right. But they did a very extensive investigation. And these, this shows the holes and where the samples were taken. Penetration tests were done and, and all that sort of thing. And incidentally, the spillway for this dam goes right along the right abutment coming down here. And they made extensive use of the cone penetration test. And without going into great technical detail here, just show you the, the results, the collective results of many, many uh, cone penetration tests. And this is showing the, the cone penetration resistance versus the friction ratio. And if you plot all the data for the individual tests, it gave this massive assemblage of points. And if you divide these charts into zones, you can find, you can conclude, you know from prior experience that if they'll have a lot of data here, the material is likely to be very liquefiable. If you have it here um, in this zone, it's not going to be, uh, uh, oh, it's possible to have some liquefaction, but there weren't many points in there, so it wasn't a much concern. Over here is where the mass of the embankment information plotted. And, and that particular zone that you saw there was not liquefiable at all. And that had a very important impact on what they decided. Here is what they decided to do um, before they knew that the embankment itself was not very liquefiable. They were going to build uh, a buttress after they did the cement deep soil mixing block here by just mixing the foundation soil in place with cement and uh, the these show where the existing buttresses the reservoir is and so on and so forth but by concluding that the embankment itself was not highly liquefiable, this, this material here, they concluded they did not to have, they did not need such a large buttress or such a large block of stabilized soil here. And that meant that they could reduce the size of these things to what you see here in this diagram. And it turned out that that saved lots and lots of money. And of course, it took a lot less time to undergo the remediation for this particular dam. And so that's what was done in the end. And they, they uh, carried it all out. And if we look here, this is sort of a summary of everything that was done to San Pablo Dam, starting back uh, in the uh, well, starting back at the beginning, and <laughs> when they first first filled the reservoir in 1929, the, it looked like this. In 1967, they put in a small downstream uh, stream buttress, and there it is right there. 1980, they finished the upstream buttress. 2004, they lowered the reservoir. 2010, they had completed the remediation with this treated so soil, soil mix loam and uh, uh, the other things that you see in that diagram. I'm sorry that I inadvertently hit the uh, advance button when I shouldn't. But anyhow, you, I think, get the story from what you saw there. And this is the completed project from the air. And they used to the, the uh, uh, deep cement block down here and the downstream buttress are here. 
the upstream buttresses on here. And uh, it all came out uh, looking pretty neat and tidy and being satisfactory. And this is an aerial view of San Pablo Dam. And that project, as far as I know, is still in good shape. Okay, now we'll look at the other dam. This is the so-called Mormon Island Auxiliary Dam. And you can see the dam is right here. This is up near Sacramento. It's an earth-filled dam. It's in what they call Blue Ravine. It's at Folsom Lake. And this, this dam is about 110 feet high. The crest length is about 4,800 feet. And uh, it gives the drainage area for all of this particular dam. Now, this dam is part of a larger complex of, of uh, dikes and dams and drainage facilities to make the Folsom project what it is. It's a very large flood control and water storage facility. To give you some idea of that, uh, it's on the American River, and there's Sacramento down there, and here's the, Ameri the American River, and here's Folsom Main Dam is here. It's a concrete dam. Uh, in a later slide, you'll see, you'll see what it looks like. But this Mormon Island Auxiliary Dam was to block a, a low, low zone right here, and it was built right here. Here is the whole Folsom uh, general plan for what was going on here. Here are the rivers that are coming through the North Fork of the American River, the South Fork of the American River. That's the main river that's being dammed. Here's the Mormon Island Auxiliary Dam. Here's the main concrete gravity dam. And you will see that there are a series of dikes just to bring the reservoir elevation up to the desired uh, level. That's why all those dikes were put there. So the upgrade of this facility involved not just the Mormon Island Dam, which everybody knew was susceptible to, to failure in an earthquake, but to be sure that the dikes were okay and these, these wing dams that are surrounding the, the uh, Concrete dam is all fine. And at the same time, they put in a big, a huge billion dollar, couple billion dollar uh, uh, auxiliary spillway that has been finished now, I think. And uh, it comes down through here. But uh, we weren't a part of that problem. That was a whole different thing. So here we are, and there's, here's the dam. And uh, Looking at it from the air, here is the Mormon Island Auxiliary Dam. And here is Folsom Dam, that's the concrete dam. It's a pretty big structure. And the dikes and all that are at various places around the reservoir. And this is the main dam, the concrete dam here. And these are wing dams. Uh, the right wing dam over here and the left wing dam here. And Mormon Island, just as a matter of historical interest, Mormon Island, it was a mining community back in the, in the uh, latter part of the 1800s. And it had a lot of uh, Mormon immigrants and they were seeking their fortune along the American River. At the peak, the community was a home to some 2,500 residents, four hotels, one school and seven saloons. Um, and it says the island was formed just by the, uh, the, the features that were there in a man-made canal and so on. And, uh, and the town was a little bit south of this canal. And that's just sort of historical interest. But the, the, the uh, mining operations, which was dredging uh, operations and, and uh, looking for gold, left a lot of uh, uh, dredger tailings. And the, those tailings figured very heavily 
in the Mormon Island Auxiliary Dam. And the project was built by our Corps of Engineers during 1948 to 1956. And then they transferred the operation and maintenance to the Bureau of Reclamation in 1956. The Mormon Island Auxiliary Dam is uh, 110 feet high and some 4,800 feet long. And the problem was these dredge, dredger tailings. And they were not compacted at all. They were just dumped in the, in the uh, waterway and they were there and they were loose and they had low penetration resistance and were susceptible to, to liquefaction. So here is, here is what the cross section of that dam looked like. Here's the shell, which is compacted compacted mine tailings. And this was the dredged alluvium dumped in here. This is the, these are the zones right here that are considered uh, of concern because they are susceptible to liquefaction. Because if you look at this uh, for analysis purposes, they worked out the, uh, penetration resistance of this material here. And uh, this, this material here had an average penetration resistance of about 6.5 blows per foot, which from a liquefaction standpoint is, is very concerning. So it's very, it's very scary uh, because it's not going to be very resistant. And so they needed then to come up ways with ways to improve the ground to make it resistant for the anticipated earthquake. And these numbers are the values of the famous N160 that seems to be uh, the guidelines for uh, what you need for liquefaction resistance. So from the late 1980s to 1994, they did some modifications of the dam. This is the upstream before any ground treatment. This is a rather uh, main highway. It's not a freeway or anything like that, but it's a heavily traveled highway. At the time they began this work, this area out here looked like that. There wasn't much there. However, you go there today and this is all developed. It's all residents and, and uh, uh, businesses and all kinds of stuff in through there. And it's a perfect illustration of the increasing number uh, of population at risk since the original construction of the dam. Well, the first thing that they did was to try and stabilize the ground underneath the upstream shell of the dam. So they use deep dynamic compaction in the dredged alluvium. This is the upstream shell right in here. And then they put a post-treatment berm on top of this right here. And again, the shell itself is pretty good. It's this alluvium that's the bad stuff. And so that's where they did deep dynamic compaction. They were able to get at that earlier than they were planning because California was in one of their droughts, which is now a way of life, it seems like in California. And the reservoir was lower than it would have been ordinarily. So they were able to get in and do the work. Uh, there was no required drawdown of the reservoir to get access because the reservoir had named normally uh, uh, fallen because of the drought. So, and this was done in 1990. And this is a photograph of the deep dynamic compaction here. And they, and they evaluated it by using 
a, 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 a preset pattern of where they're going to do the dynamic compaction. And you know, this is a densification by dropping heavy weights. Uh, and you'll hear about that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, but this is just showing what they were doing. And they were using uh, to get the penetration resistance something called the Becker penetration test. I don't know if that's uh, in, in use there in Chile, uh, but it's something that had been developed, particularly in the Western US, uh, for dealing with materials that have particle sizes that are too large to use a standard penetration test. You have big pieces of, of rock uh, in this kind of material. And so they needed something that would uh, do a, be a suitable penetration test. And so the Becker penetration test was developed and it's done using a 168 millimeter diameter uh, double wall casing driven using a diesel pile driving hammer. And it's used, like I say, in soils containing gravel, gravel and, and cobbles. And this is just showing where they're doing different tests. And uh, it was for, for, for construction control. Now, the deep dynamic compaction itself was done in a zone that was 800 by 150 feet. And the, the drop weight for the dynamic compaction was 35 tons. It was a 6.5 foot, essentially a two meter diameter uh, uh, cylindrical steel and concrete. And they dropped it from 108 feet and uh, the energy released was, be a, uh, was the equivalent of a 98 foot free fall because there is some energy loss during the process of dropping this weight uh, of cables being uh, pulled off for reels and so on and uh, the efficiency is a little bit less than 100%. But that's what the energy was that was delivered. And they did this in a program that involved uh, several coverages, as you can see here. And they began with a pattern of 50 feet center to center, dropping the weight 30 times at each, pla at each place. And then, uh, a secondary pass, their coverage, at points that were located between the original drop points, 30 times. And then the third time, they split the secondary spacing and did 15 drops. And then when they are already up, uh, done, essentially, to smooth out the whole surface, they ironed it by going edge to edge just dropping the weight uh, 30 feet uh, at successive points to smooth everything off, okay? So that's what was done in the dynamic compaction program. And this shows the Becker penetration resistance. And generally speaking, the Becker penetration test has been equated to the standard penetration test in the terms of the number of counts and so everything is converted to a, an N160. And this shows the values as a function of depth pre-treatment. And this, these show what it looked like after treatment. And this happens to be the, the, uh, the fourth, fourth time around at, at different locations. And this, this is the primary after the first dropping of the weight uh, where they did the test, they got this variation. Now, what you see is very characteristic of what happens when you're doing dynamic compaction. You get reasonably high densification near the ground surface, but as you go down, you lose the improvement. And that's very logical. It's because the impact uh, stress dissipates with depth and you're not getting as much compression to, uh, at, at this depth down here as you do at the top. And so you've got to be prepared 
to know that the depth of improvement will be limited if you use deep dynamic compaction and it will it it will uh the amount of improvement that you can count on will decrease with depth uh and this shows it very nicely for this particular project here now having finished that they went on to look at what they're going to be dealing with downstream at this uh, thing and they 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 uh decided they were going to use some sort of a, a stone column kind of remediation and there are different ways of doing the stone column treatments and they chose ultimately after doing a very extensive uh field test of 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 uh, column con uh, construction and compaction methods, uh, they found that doing a bottom uh, feed, bottom fed, fed rock for the column, wet replacement using water, uh, making some stone columns. And so they wanted to have a zone that was this wide from here to over here. And they knew the depth that they were trying to get to. At the, at the same time, they anticipated that if they didn't do something and this material here, the dredged alluvian that wasn't treated, and this material over here, which is the tailing, the dredged alluvium, if it li liquefied in an earthquake, it would generate excess pore pressures. And if they couldn't do something about those excess pore pressures, they would all migrate into this treated zone and it would lose its effectiveness to resist the liquefaction as well. And so they very uh, ingeniously uh, put in drainage zones on each side, one over here and one over here. And they used mini columns, uh, gravel drains sort of thing in there to intercept any, any water trying to flow from here to here or from here to here. And that's why they did that. And uh, that's the way they treated it. And for control here, they divided the treatment zone into these 18 sections and had certain quality control uh, criteria put in place to ensure that they were getting what they had hoped to get for this section that's 900 feet long and 200 feet wide. So this is a photograph of the work in progress. And this is an important note, the temporary steepening of the downstream embankment slope to provide a level working platform. It's a lot easier to, <laughs> do your stone column installation over a level area than it would be on the slope of the downstream face. However, if in the process you have to seep in the slope, which you do in order to get this level working space, then you've got an increased liability and increased risk for potential failure of your embankment while that slope is open. That's just one of those uh, related things that you have to keep in mind when you're doing this sort of work. But anyhow, that all went fine. Here's some equipment working at Mormon Island and uh, uh, they got it all installed nicely. And the blow counts for this material before looked like this. And after they look like this and they attributed this lower zone here in part, anyhow, the fact that the material down here had a higher fines content and a low plasticity as opposed to these um, more clean, less plastic uh, cohesionless layers up here and concluded then it would be that it would be okay uh, to have this lower resistance down here. 
but that opinion didn't last. But at that point in time, in 1994, they had done the deep dynamic compaction over here on the downstream slide, side and recognized that at the bottom, the ground improvement would not have been great because the dynamic compaction does not reach that depth. And then on the, on the downstream side over here, they had put uh, the stone columns in and they did have this zone uh, and a lot of agonizing uh, uh, went on as to about, well, is that safe or is it unsafe? Uh, can we accept it or can't we? This was in a, in an, in a uh, re reevaluation that began in about 2004. And what happened then is they said they, it was interesting actually. Uh, I remember that I, I was working uh, on the, the review board uh, for that with some other people you might know, like Ralph Peck and now Ross Boulanger, who I think probably has been to Chile a few times. And uh, uh, we were in, on, this, on, the, on this board and it was one of these situations, uh, is it gonna liquefy or isn't it gonna liquefy? Will you stake your career on it or won't you, you know? We, I can remember very clearly said of spending an afternoon, we debated and debated and simply could not be convinced that there was no risk for liquefaction in that zone. And so uh, it wasn't, it couldn't be demonstrated and concluded that it was still possible within the lower part of the stone column treatment zone. Um, and by then, people were using risk analyses and figuring out annual failure probabilities, annualized loss of life, and so on, and uh, taking such guidelines as were available and coming to the conclusion that uh, it, it was going to give failure probabilities that were just too high. So what are they going to do now? Well, they concluded no more upstream treatment. Um, we needed downstream modification that would prevent loss of freeboard and overtopping or global stability failure if the upstream embankment fails. And uh, uh, this seems a reasonable approach. Just say, okay, we'll sacrifice the upstream, but if it goes, well, I still have my freeboard protected adequately so that we don't overtop the dam. Will I be okay downstream? And they showed that a high strength foundation key block along the stone column treatment zone and a properly filtered blanket stability berm could provide the required resistance. The original idea was, well, let's see if we can't build it by uh, putting in a key block down there and we'll do it by jet grouting. Well, they did a big test program and they just simply couldn't provide the needed strength and continuity. And so what was decided was to put in a big excavation and replace with a concrete shear block along the downstream toe and a blank of stability berm over the top of it. This is just showing what it looked like when they set up to do the do the uh, jet grouting test section, but it didn't seem to work, so they abandoned all that. And they built this big this big block of concrete was was built in this excavated thing here. These are secant walls here. Oops. Uh oh. Can I get it back? There we go. This is a uh, a, a secant wall and cross brace. And this just shows the sequence in, in, in building this thing. And 
Um, it was constructed. And this is a big block of concrete. And this is what that cross section of the key block looked like after it had been excavated. And the rock surface at the bottom of this, these cells became of considerable importance because you didn't want to leave a smooth rock surface on which the whole embankment could slide. And so care was taken to be sure that things were clean, concrete was bond. They did tests on the uh, joint between the concrete that's up above there and the uh, native rock and so on. It was a, a big consideration. And this is what one of the open cells looked like. And then this is when they were beginning to place the overlay fill uh, in 2014. And I think that that was completed in 2017, I believe. And uh, the the uh, uh, first phase, which concrete key block, key block was $25 million. And the, uh, I don't think I told you on, on the, on the uh, San Pablo Dam, what the saving was by reducing the size of the, uh, of the uh, buttress and and cement the uh, cement stabilized zone, but that was forty seven million dollars on that project. They saved by that design change. Uh, anyhow, back to this one. The uh, it cost them forty five million dollars for the, uh, the downstream buttress, buttress, and twenty five million for the key block. And so this is what the whole thing looks like now uh, with all its ram uh, modifications in it. And, and here's, here's the key block, here's the key block right there, right there. And then they just put compacted fill over the top and there's the downstream buttress right there. And uh, the, the, the uh, Deep dynamic compaction is right here. So it's all finished. So what are some of the lessons from these two projects? Well, we've said this earlier, the seismic considerations were minimal for construction, all that construction before the 1960s. And the things have increased over time. Seismicity, probable maximum floods have gone up. Populations have gone up. Potential failure mode analysis and risk assessment provide major inputs to a lot of these projects now. And, and they've been very helpful. And uh, needless to say, what's going on now certainly is taking account of climate change, the increasing number and magnitude of extreme events, floods, storms, earthquakes, and so on that need to be considered. Uh, and I think each of these uh, projects demonstrate that getting it right the first time can be very difficult given the unknowns and uncertainties at the time of initial design and construction. I think we probably could do better at it now than they could in uh, 1900, but still uh, it's always a challenge. I'm gonna skip that and that there, there, okay. And overall, I think that, that from a remediation strategy standpoint, simpler is better. The focus is now downstream because upstream work requires reservoir drawdown and working over and through water, neither of which you like. And again, you can allow an upstream failure if the downstream is buttressed to prevent excess loss of freeboard, and if you can demonstrate it by suitable analysis. Excavate and replace plus a downstream overlay or buttress is simple and reliable, but again, it may involve elevated failure risk during construction because it's steep and slopes and that sort of thing. Nowadays, there's a lot more being done with dynamic deformation analysis that are helpful. Um, 
and a reasonable but sometimes unattainable goal, bring a dam to a state that is as safe as if it were being designed and built today. You need to know the subsurface materials or boundaries and how the relevant properties are assigned. It's site characterization, which remains always a challenge. Um, but it's useful to review the original information on which you're starting from and what goes right back to the beginning of the structure. Um, because incorrect identification and characterization of materials can lead to overestimating the needed extent of ground improvement and unnecessary extra cost. But it could work the other way too. It could be unconservative if you make your uh, original estimates and identifications incorrectly. These are just a few observations on the ground improvement technologies and their application in these kinds of problems. Uh, certainly, I think that, uh, that deep soil mixing applications are on the increase whereas maybe some of the vibro replacement things and like uh, that sort of thing, not being used as much. Um, jet grouting on the scale that we were talking about here uh, in dam foundations uh, is probably not uh, gonna be a first choice. Uh, it's difficult, it's costly, and it sometimes doesn't give you the results that you need. And I think we all would agree that what you can see and measure invariably a better and more reliable option than what you can't, provided the costs and construction risks are acceptable. And uh, on, on these projects now, uh, sustainability uh, is being given uh, a lot of attention. These are some of the problems that seem to continue. Hard to get a handle on them all. Uh, in spite of the, the so-called elegance of some of these risk analysis, it sometimes is difficult to, to understand and interpret what they mean. It's hard to decide the acceptable level of risk. I think we're making progress, but it's been a challenge to assess the true lack of liquefaction potential of soils containing gravel and cobbles. Silty soils have been a problem. Residual strength uh, is still a problem. Uh, always challenges in assessing the compliance with specifications. There's been a lot of progress, and even since this slide was made, in selecting and implementing appropriate soil constitutive models for liquefaction and dynamic deformation analysis. Um, and how, re but how, how reliable and how accurate is your dynamic deformation analysis? For a while, a lot of folks would say, well, you get an answer for let's say the amount of deformation and maybe you're right within a factor of two, one way or the other. And Sometimes we have problems anticipating future increases in demand. So, just a couple of concluding comments. Assuring the safety of existing embankments is a major problem. And I was just, I think it was just reading today on a smart brief column, the number of dams that there are in this country and the, the number of dams that need fixing. It's staggering. Um, but we have increasing populations. We need to protect vital components of infrastructure and so on. These extreme events, which seem to be coming even more frequency and with greater intensity, can dominate remedial designs. Uh, but at the same time, we got to keep uh, close attention paid to such things as seepage, piping, stability, maintenance, 
the free boards, slope protection, got to always sure, be sure of those things. Um, the continued need for better material characterization, site characterization. And it's a worthy goal, I think, to make the existing efficient dam as safe as if you were starting a new project today. So I think that gets me to the end of what I wanted to say. And, and uh, I believe uh, there's an opportunity to ask questions. And um, I'm ready. Well, I may not be ready, but I'll try. Thank you very, very much, Professor Mitchell. It, it was a great talk. It was a really nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if there are any questions for Professor Mitchell? Maybe in the chat, here in the chat, I am checking. No, we don't have questions here in on the chat. Let me check here on YouTube. See, I'm 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 a little fearsome when there are no questions. It means one of two things. Um, you understood absolutely everything, or you understood nothing. I think it's the is the the option of everyone understood everything. It it was a really clear and, and nice talk. I really I, I really mean it. I. Yes, there is one question here, and I'm sure more, many, many more will come. Um, uh, Professor Verdugo, you were there? Yeah. I am the only one that it. We cannot hear it well, Professor. I can't hear him. Thank you. It's difficult to hear you, Professor Verdugo. Yeah, it sounds like he, he's having problems with the internet. Can you put it in the chat? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to let him know that. Uh, Professor Verdugo, are you there now? Maybe? Yes. The internet is, is not working well, it seems. Professor Verdugo, maybe you can write down your... Maybe, your don't you want to write it down, it Professor be. Verdugo? Oh, Karina was, sorry, Karina. Is it better now? Yeah, a little bit better. A little bit better, okay. Uh, Professor Mitchell, we used several years ago solely improvement via dynamic compaction. And when we tested and we checked the results using SPT, when we, up, when we measure, when we run the SPT test just after the, uh, the dynamic compaction, we got certain number. But after one week, the SPT was better. And after one month, the SPT were even higher and better. Do you have any idea of this happen when we use a dynamic compaction? Um, there is an effect on the, on the maturation uh, Test with time. Yeah, it, it sounds like an example of what we found in many situations where you can have a, 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 a continued improvement extending over a fair, fair period of time following the densification. Mm. We ran into this at the, at the uh, Jebba Dam in Nigeria and, oh, this was now 40 years ago, I guess. Uh, and it was very, very surprising because the penetration resistance might even have been lower after we did some things and, and it started to, to climb. And, and, and we, uh, 
um, out of ignorance, I guess, as much as anything, uh, tried to explain it. And it's happened in, in, in enough cases now that I think we're getting an understanding of what's going on. And it's, it's, a, it's, like, a, it's like a secondary compression in, in, in uh, uh, you know, in settlement analysis, some, something like that, that the, the, the uh, arrangement of particles is, is slowly adjusting itself uh, maybe pore pressures are dissipating it so, to some extent, but that's not been a major factor. But there has been uh, stuff that we put in the general category of aging, and it seems to be uh, readjustments of, of structure and stress in the ground, and it's, it's uh, coming to a new equilibrium that's even uh, better than what you achieve by the dynamic compaction. I see. Very interesting. And so it happened. Thank you very much to confirm, for confirming that. It was a big surprise for us. But by how much that improvement is, is uh, how much is the, is the improvement that you see in time? Maybe 10%, 15%? Well, see, what you're asking are the two most difficult questions in connection <laughs> with that. Is, how fast and how much <laughs> does it improve? Because they are granular, granular materials, right? Yeah. Generally, below, below. Generally. They generally are, yeah. So might, might, could it be possible that after compaction, there might be some evidence of particle breakage? That has happened. Uh, not well. I don't think. Maybe some would continue to. Maybe some. Okay. Maybe some. But, uh, yeah. But uh, not significantly to explain the I secondary compression. Yeah, I, I I think this uh, this readjustment of of the fabric and and they're getting so they're starting to to get confirmation of that now by means of some of the new uh, imaging techniques and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, analysis methods using discrete element uh, modeling and things like that. And so we're, uh, I think that, that in general, we're sort of converging on the kinds of stuff that's going on. And uh, it is actually uh, uh, maybe a slight compression continuing, but a readjustment of, of stresses and uh, arrangements of particles. Very nice, very nice. Um, I wonder if there are more questions for Professor Mitchell. Excuse me, a second question, Professor Mitchell. And now people are providing information or data showing that gravelly material may look fine. May what? Uh, uh, and, but the, and the problem is, uh, which would be the, the best way to uh, figure out whether a, a gravity material may liquefy because the only tool that we have is BPT and also shear wave velocity. So do, do you know, first, my question is whether, do you believe that gravity material may liquefy or not? Real gravel, I mean, with uh, two or three inches uh, in particle diameter. Oh, that, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> that I, I haven't followed the, the gravel very closely, so I'd hate to, I think, I think so, uh, some of the recent publications from Kyle Rollins uh, that are in some of the literature might be helpful, because I know he's made a big study of that, of, of gravels, but I don't, I just don't know his latest findings. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely a challenge. Thank you. Yeah. Professor Mitchell, there are some more questions. I, I think Karina has them. Yeah, we have some questions from the YouTube channel. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, we have a question from Jorge Leon Yanis. He says, thank you for the presentation. How was the seismic performance of uh, MI? 
AD. Yeah. During the 1980, yeah, during the 1980 Loma Pride earthquake, it seems that the mitigation work started after the date of the earthquake. Yeah, the, see the the. I don't think there was any any problem there. The Loma Prieta earthquake was probably not as severe there as it was in the Bay Area. It was another. A uh, fair distance away, so I'm not sure that it was much of a test of the Mormon Island Dam. I see. I see. Okay. Uh, what we have another question from YouTube from Rodrigo Pineda. He says, "Where are some pitching studies done?" What? Can you repeat that, please? Yeah, he says, where uh, some teaching studies done, but I think it's not the complete question. Yeah, I'm yeah we have nice. another. We have another from Carlo Campo Verde. What is your work in which you have more difficulties and why? What What is the work in what? The most difficult in work. Which, yes. <laughs> Your most difficult work and why? Most difficult work and why? No. See. Re regarding to dams, I, I I guess in that context. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you how you define difficult. I mean, the problems are generally complex. Uh, the most is stressful. <laughs> it was, it was very like stressful. Uh, but the dams are stressful in general. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I can recall back in again in the in the early 1980s when we were working on the the Jebba Dam in Nigeria, we needed we needed deep improvement in sand, and and uh, uh, ultimately resorted to using deep blasting because nothing else would go deep enough. And uh, confirming that it had done the job was a, a real challenge. We did find time effects there to be very important. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure yeah. of that. Well, well, but part of our justification in the end was, well, at least we know that the ground has been shaken because we've done all these explosions. To what depth did you send the send the explosives it's about 100 100 feet more than 30 meters oh. wow. and, and for how long for how long did you measure improvement oh it was a matter of i think weeks weeks yeah i see i see very interesting very 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 interesting and so um, one, one of the aspects that resonated with me regarding the, the, some of the concluding comments that you had was the fact of reviewing carefully because that's something that not, it's not done all the time. Like, taking for granted that the previous work is properly yeah. well done. Yeah, well, you know, you, I think- You spent case, a lot of time on that? Uh, did what? You, 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 did you used to spend a lot of time double checking that some of that the previous results were properly obtained or sometimes you no, have to- No, to uh, this them happened to be the, the engineer the engineers that were working on San Pablo Dam, uh, there had while there had been some laboratory tests that suggested the material was liquefiable, they began to have some doubts based on what they were getting from their samples and field tests. And so they went back through the previous information very, very carefully. And uh, that's what led to the complete uh, uh, change in views on on what that embankment material would do. 
And it was their perseverance. And, and uh, you can say, well, it's because they had all those additional test results. That's true. Uh, and it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a reflection on inadequacy on the, uh, the work that was done, but it was, it was uh, done carefully in a state of the art uh, originally. Uh, but the large, large amount of new information made mm -hmm. it uh, more reasonable to cast doubt on what, what the conclusions were. Indeed. Seemed to pay off. Absolutely. I think we have the question uh, that... Uh, Karina is telling us that the question in YouTube uh, was uh, reassessed. And um, what kind of explosives were used to do the, the studies in the dam, in the upstream side? That's what he, he meant. Ah, well, the explosive, the, 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 in that project, This was done before the embankment was built. Okay. Yeah. Before the embankment was built. Yeah, it was done in advance. I see. I see. I, I think that was the, the last question. Uh, we have one more question. And I think with that, we are, we are set. Uh, it's from uh, Fabiano Lea. Uh, if you have any comments about the state of the art regarding unsaturated soil analysis, I guess this is also in the context of uh, dams. Sa saturated soil? Unsaturated soil, Uns soil analysis. Um, there's a lot of new information becoming available. Uh, but I, unsaturated soil mechanics is, is something that I have not done much at all in. And part of the reason for that is I've just considered it to be too hard. <laughs> It's very challenging. <laughs> but It's I, very challenging. I know there's a lot of new information available now and, and, and ways to approach some of these. There was a, a series it came out of, it came up, It came out of Australia within the past month, a series of lectures. Oh, yeah. 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 AGRP. They were the lectures from all over the world were doing uh, new things on partly saturated soils. So that would be a good place to look for new information. From one of the lectures from the last World Conference. That yeah, was well, this, this, this was a whole series of lectures, there were about six of them, I think, uh, uh, about partly saturated soil. Mm. If I you see. go to that A-G-E-R-P. Oh, okay, it's out. another conference. Okay, okay, okay. I, yeah, think, I, I, know they, 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 I think this is a second or third topic that they've taken up and they're doing it from, from Brisbane, Australia. Uh, And most of their lectures, I don't think these are, are available online yet, but I think that they will be. But anyhow, the, and the International Society has a committee. Yeah, on the unsaturated. Doing things with partly saturated soils. And it's just, a, it's a field that I have sort of just stayed away from. I see. Good, great, 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 great. Um, I think we don't have any more questions. Uh, Okay. I think we are. I think we are. We are set for today. We have a lot of congratulations to your presentation because it was a fantastic presentation. Um, I I I really resonated a lot with many of the of the comments that that you did. And thank you very much. Thank okay. you very much again for for taking the time for being here with us. Uh, we really learned a lot. Well, thank you. Uh, our students for sure are very thankful for, for your talk and also the practitioners. We had a lot of practitioners too on YouTube and also here we had some other colleagues 
attending yeah. the, the seminar. So okay. again, Professor Mitchell, thank you very, very much thank for you. sharing your knowledge with us. And uh, in case you have some last words, just to, 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 to say bye. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much again. Okay, thank you, Philip. It's been my pleasure, my honor, and uh, uh, best wishes to everybody. Thank you very much, Professor, and we look forward to keeping in contact. Thank you, thank you. very much, and we also look forward for your book. Ah, thank you. For your book, <laughs> very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mitchell. Bye. And thank bye, you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. And thank you, everyone, for, for coming here to this new...